so I know you're with me. Hey, listen, right now we've, we've, we've sang, we've had our coffee. Who had coffee? Anyone have coffee? Donuts? Yeah. Donuts were good, right? Donuts were good. Red Velvet, Red Velvet is back, okay? And, and I have the best son in the church because he left one in my office for me. That's a good boy, right? It's a good boy. Hey, listen, we're here in the, we're, we're, we're now, we're at that place in our gathering where the preacher preaches the sermon, right? It's kind of like the centerpiece, not because of the messenger, definitely not because of the messenger, but it's kind of the centerpiece of the weekend gathering of the church, right? It's we all waiting for that, we're singing and we're giving and we're praying and then at some point the, the man of God gets up and I say that and that's difficult for me to say that. I only know it because the Bible says it, not the way I feel about myself. But he gets up and he opens up the word of God and he starts to preach and it's like super important. Why is it the centerpiece of the weekend gathering? Well, I just say this. If there's a God, and if there truly is a place called heaven where it's good, and there's a place called hell where it's what? Bad. And if there's truly a way to navigate through life and end up in the good place, and if there's a way that we're supposed to live our life that blesses this God and brings blessing into your life, if, if he did write it down in a book and preserved it so that you might know these things, well, then it's important. It's, listen, it's the most important thing in the world. There's nothing more important than this. It doesn't matter what you drive or where you work or what you own or what you're wearing or what you're having for lunch or your kids or your spouse. Nothing compares to the importance of this if what I just mentioned to you is true, right? And so that's why you're supposed to read it. And that's why you're supposed to study it. And that's why you're supposed to meditate on it day and night. I don't want to be offensive. But there's a biblical illiteracy that is rampant in the body of Christ. Rampant. And think about this. If what I just it got heavy quick, right? <laughs> Usually there's an intro. If what I just said to you is true, that there's a God, there's a heaven, there's a hell, there's a way, Jesus, and there's a way to live that's good and right, if those things are true and your eternity depend on that and the eternity of those that you encounter, because you're the disciple maker, right? If, if, If their eternity rests upon that, how can we say, take four years of high school and some of us will go on to a trade school or a university and take four more years and go to class every day and go home at night and study and study and study and study because that will greatly determine the trajectory of our next, what, 50 or 60 years, right? But this will, more than anything else, direct the trajectory of, let's just say, the next million years. And how much study is spent in this word when you understand the gravity of the results of studying it or not. Think about that. And I wonder why anyone in this room right now, here I am coming at your heart, I wonder why anyone in this room right now does not have a Bible in their hand. You're in church. Why do you come to church? To listen to me? Say no. Right? You're here to to, to hear God's word. Get a copy of God's word and put it in your hand. If it's a Bible, a paper one, awesome. If it's a phone, get your phone out. 
But let me tell you something about your phone. You know how easy it is to flip from the Bible app to Facebook? Get on a real Bible. I'm just telling you, nothing wrong with a phone Bible, but it's just so, listen, I, I'm telling you out of voice of experience, easily distracted. Anyone else ADHD in this house? Am I the only one? You already forgot what I said. That's why you haven't raised your hand, right? Right? Everyone should raise their hand, right? And that's why you don't study on a phone, because Facebook is right there, right? So you just get, listen, you know what else? Let me ask you, what else is in the Bible other than God's word? Yeah. Nothing, right? So that's why it's just awesome to have a real Bible. You can write in it. It just feels good. Listen, can't do that with a phone. Open up your Bible. Listen, open up your Bible to Acts chapter 17. The reason why we're going to jump into Acts 17, and the reason why we jump into the Bible every single week when you come to Revolution Church is because it's my desire and the desire of the Lord is that you would not be biblically illiterate. It's so important that you understand, know, and understand what this book has to say. You're, listen, your eternity rests on you understanding what this says. You understand the importance of it, right? So Acts chapter 17, while you're turning there, I want to just, I want to share with you um, this COVID thing that we're going through. It's done a lot of things. But one of the things that I've seen that it's done is it has exposed, it has exposed some real weakness in the church of Jesus Christ in our country. And when I mean by that is what I've been saying these last five minutes or so. There's biblical illiteracy. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. So, so I, I post, you guys know our church never closed, right? We're one of the few. We didn't close. It says you're supposed to, you know, get together, right? So, so I go online and I post it, right? No harm, no foul, right? Bro, right? Bro. Man, I got just ripped to shreds. You know, like I'm like the modern day Hitler, apparently. So I get, listen, I, I got, I got, here's, here, this is, this is just one example. So this, I'm sure she's a wonderful lady. She, I don't remember her name, I wouldn't tell you it anyway, but she said that I am disqualified as a, she, as God's shepherd because no good shepherd would lead his flock into danger. Now, can we all agree that that sounds good? Like, I get that, right? You know what? I'm not going to willingly go down an alley if I see a couple of dudes with chains and guns and knives. Like, that's stupid, right? So it sounds good. It's pleasing. It's nice. But is it true? See, that's the thing. Is it true? Because... We're the pillar and foundation of the truth. That's what the Bible says, right? That the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. So is it true that a shepherd, no good God-fearing, Jesus-appointed shepherd would ever lead his flock into danger? Well, I ask you to jump over real quick. Keep your finger in Acts 17 and put your eyes on Acts 20. Just a couple pages. Acts chapter 20, verse 22, 23. Holler when you're there. Anyone else? I need someone on the right side of the room to tell me they're there. Okay, awesome. Look at it says. This is Paul, right? He goes, I don't exactly know what awaits me, because he's traveling around from city to city spreading the gospel, right? He goes, I'm not, I don't exactly know what awaits me, but the Holy Spirit, and I'm, hold up, put your eyes up here for a second. How many people think that the Holy Spirit's a good shepherd? He tells you what to do. It's good, right? He's not going to tell you something that's wrong. He's going to tell you something good. Watch this. I don't, know, I don't know exactly know what awaits me, but the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city, not like one time I, I had tacos last night and I heard something. No, 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 no. Time after time, city after city, you know what he tells them? That jail and suffering lie ahead. Safe pasture, right? No danger. You're going to get whipped and beaten. You're going to get shipwrecked. You're going to finally get on land, and when you get there, you're going to get bitten by a poisonous snake. Safe pastors. You ever hear of a missionary 
church missionaries, right? The, 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 the people that go into other places, remote places across the earth to, to bring the gospel, right? Some of them are cushy places. Man, I just feel like I need to go to Los Angeles or Hawaii and get the gospel out, right? How many people are up for that one, right? Sign, sign up sheet would be full. But how many of you would like to join uh, John Patton? Put him up there on the screen for a second. You might not know this guy, probably don't know this guy. I didn't know this guy until this week. I don't really know him, he's dead. John Patton, he lived there from 1824 to 1907 uh, in Scotland. And let me tell you a little bit about John Patton. At age 12, he heard the Lord say this. Go across the seas as the messenger of my love. And lo, I am with you always. Let me just show you about the, the, the travels of John Patton. Bring that first map up there. You see that up there? Kind of get a bearing as to where you are, right? So you see North America in the pink. That's us. Pretty in pink. You see up there that top where the line is at the top, that little circle? That's Scotland. And because God called him to go, he and his wife in 1858 get on a boat and they travel 8,400 nautical miles in a boat to the New Hebrides Islands in the South Pacific, that little area over there to the right of Australia. Do you see it there? And you know what's there? Cannibals. The whole island that he's going to is inhabited by man-eaters. But God called him to go. And so in 1858, he takes his wife, he puts her on a boat, to go visit the uncivilized man-eaters that have no known language that they could have a conversation in. And so led by Jesus, the good shepherd, they're led to go share the gospel. And so in 1858, he and his wife get on the boat, and much like the lady on Facebook who can't understand why would you lead your people to a dangerous situation. Well, he had some people that felt the same way. Like, what's wrong with you, man? What about the people here? What about your wife? What did she do to deserve this? You would, you're a husband. You're supposed to protect her. You're, you're not supposed to lead her there. So it's documented that one of the elders of his church, an elder, not some Joe Schmo, but a guy who's qualified to lead the church, who knows the scriptures, all of that, qualifications of a, of a bishop, of an overseer of the church, a Mr. Dixon. He's, he's like, man, you're crazy. He says, you'll be eaten by cannibals. To which Patton responded, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. I will say, loved ones, that being a Christian doesn't mean you just go to church on Sunday because it's good for you. It is good for you. And I'm glad that you're here this morning, and I think that you will greatly be benefited by being here. But being a Christian means you are no longer your own, that you've been purchased by God, and the price was the, pl was the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, you have been created anew in Christ for kingdom advancing good works. And so no longer is it, listen, loved ones, we got to get out of the American mindset that says, what can my king do for me? But it should be, what can I do 
for my king. That's what Christianity is. And being his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Right? Look at that. Look at that place. I didn't, before, I, before I got to this mountain, I didn't even know this existed. So to Michael this morning, he's like, man, I didn't know there was all them islands out there. Here's Samoa. You might have heard of that. Here's Australia. You've heard of that. Here's New Zealand. You've heard of that. Now it's, this New Hebrides island is called Vanuatu. And this is where he went to be a witness for Christ to the ends of the earth. That was the command. Go make disciples of all people. That's the command. And that's not light work. It's hard. Christianity is difficult. It's not some walk in the park. And so as we walk through the book of Acts, chapter after chapter after chapter, that's all we see are guys like Peter and Paul and Silas and Barnabas and Stephen. They're simply responding appropriately to the call of God to go build the kingdom of God. That's all they're doing. That's all they're doing. And listen, going as we're commanded, say, I've, I've been commanded. Going, you know what I wrote? I wrote, it can be hard. But look what I did. Do you see that? I had to cross it out. Because it's not can be hard. It is hard. It is hard. What we think it is in our country is light and cushy. That's not Christianity. That's not, adv listen, advancing this thing that nobody wants to hear is not easy, right? Think about that. No one is seeking God. No one is good, right? So you're bringing a message that no one on earth wants to hear. How many people like it when they knock at your door to sell you something that you don't want? That's what you're called to do. Nobody wants to hear your message. And so it's difficult. Acts doesn't, the book of Acts does not contain peppered in here or there, little isolated occasional instances of sacrifice and suffering. The entire book of Acts, the entire book is story after story of uncomfortable it's of persevering through pers persecution, of suffering through circumstance, of pushing forward and getting pushed back and getting pushed back again and getting pushed back again, but pushing forward afresh. That's the entire book of Acts. Where's the cushy stuff that just says, it's your best life now? It's not in there. The good shepherd does, listen <laughs> This is a good one. The good shepherd doesn't always lead his flock to safe pastures, but they're always green pastures. They're always green pastures, right? And what I mean by green and good pastures is that they always serve his purposes, but not necessarily your comfort. That's the pasture that God would lead you to. And we got to... We gotta, we need a mindset change, man. We got a mindset change. And 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 soapbox. This whole thing lately with you don't have to even go, just sit on your couch and watch some dude in skinny jeans preach a message. Making it easier. Easier. Grace that's cheap. Nothing's expected of you. Just say yes to Jesus and you'll go to heaven. But you see that in the book of Acts as they respond to who Jesus is and what he preached and what he taught and what he did. It's not in there. And so here in Acts 17, we see it one more time. Another story of the same. Paul and Silas have responded responded to the Macedonian call that we saw last week in Acts 16. Remember when they're trying to preach over in this part and the Holy Spirit of Christ says, no, you can't preach there. It's like, okay, well, then let's go over here and we'll preach over here. And once again, the Holy Spirit says, no, but no, don't not, no, no, there's no no preaching. It's not, no, 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 you're not supposed to talk to people. 
It's no, I don't want you there right now with those people. I need you over here in Greece, in Macedonia, to go preach to them. Let me just say this. Not to make you lazy, because we're prone to get lazy, myself included. But when God says, you don't have to preach in Leesburg, I need you over in Umatilla, that doesn't mean that they're not going to get saved. He's not going to send you to Macedonia and leave the people in Bithynia to go to hell. Someone's going there, trust me. He'll send someone there, and they'll go, and they'll share the gospel. But he says, listen, don't go to that city, don't go to that city, but I need you to go to Macedonia, and I need you to preach the gospel. And it's amazing. I think of the lady who says no shepherd would ever lead his people into a dangerous situation. You can't bring them to the church. They're going to get COVID and everyone's going to die. The good shepherd told Paul to go to Macedonia. And what happened when he obeyed the call? Well, he got stripped down naked in the town square and beaten with wooden rods and thrown in prison. Well, there's a green pasture for you. How many people want to sign up for that mission trip? But it happened. It happens, right? So let's read Acts 17, 1 through 9, and see this next story here. See what happens. Maybe, hey, listen. Maybe it's different. Maybe this is the cushy part. Here it comes. You ready? Here's the part where you get to put your feet up and relax and just enjoy your Christianity. Health, wealth, prosperity, comfort. That might be the American dream, but it ain't God's dream. Acts 17. Paul and Silas, right, after they got out of prison, after they got whooped, beaten, Paul and Silas, then you think, man, well, it's a vacation. He, listen, they get to take a sabbatical, right? Must be a sabbatical time. It's time to rest. You've done, you've done all you need to do. Now it's somebody else's turn. I get to rest now. I'm going to retire and move to the villages. No. Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia and then came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service, and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Well, some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with many God-fearing Greek men and women. But some of the Jews were jealous. So they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace. Man, this is marketplace. I don't want to go there. Last chapter didn't work out for him in the marketplace. They get bring out the marketplace. He gets whipped and beaten, thrown in jail. Here they are again, right, in this other marketplace. Ooh, yo, yo. So they go, they get a posse, right? Let's go get a posse. And they form a mob. And they start a riot. You know what word I think of? Irrational. Irrational, right? Crazy behavior here. Sometimes the response doesn't seem to fit the crime, does it? I see that in our world today. They attacked the home of Jason. Why were they attacking the home of Jason? Well, they were searching for Paul and Silas, guilty by association. So they could drag them out to the crowd. They want to do it again in the next city. Drag them out, whip them, beat them, throw them in jail, right? And Paul knew this was going to happen. Because in city after city, the Holy Spirit told him, this is what's going to happen. And did it stop him? He kept going. He kept going. So they wanted, they wanted to search for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. Not finding them there, so they weren't satisfied, right? Irrational and rational. Watch this. So they drag out Jason. I know it wasn't you, but I'm going to just whip you anyway. Don't you hate it when the, your teammates in football were misbehaving, you all had to do push-ups until you puked? That guy. That's what these guys are doing. Terrible. So watch this. So not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some other of the believers. Instead, 
And they took them before the city council. We know what happens before the city council in the last chapter. That wasn't much fun. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world. It's kind of funny, right? All over the world. All over the world. So short-minded, right? They just left Jerusalem, and they're just barely out of that area of the, of the world. They've got, if you look at that world map, they hardly even scratch the surface of all over the world. But these people are so irrational, and they're short-minded thinking. They have trouble, have trouble all over the world. And now they're just here disturbing our city too. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They're all guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. The people of the well, they really weren't, they were confessing allegiance to another king, but it wasn't a worldly king. It wasn't a government king. It wasn't a military king, was it? It was a spiritual king. As a matter of fact, that king, that spiritual king, the King Jesus, he told them, hey, pay your taxes, man. Give Caesar what's due to Caesar. He was, he was a law abider. He wasn't trying to, 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 to overthrow in that sense. And these people were blaming them that that was what they were up to. The people of the city as well as the city council were thrown into turmoil by these reports. Oh, crazy. The officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond, and then they released them. So that's what it was about, huh? You needed some cash? You could have just asked me at the beginning. I would have just given you 50 bucks and let us go home. That's what they ended up doing, making them pay some money. So let's just take a notice of what opposition looks like for you. And we're going to see it here in our Bible. We saw it before as we're studying the book of Acts. What's the opposition look like? Well, they were jealous, right? Some Bible translations will say they were envious. Opposition usually comes uh, not fact-based, right, but emotionally driven, feelings-driven response. You can see it there in the text. They were jealous. They were jealous, and they were angry, because it was changing the way they wanted it. They weren't coming after him with any facts. They were just upset about it, just like the lady on the Facebook page to me. She was upset with me because she felt as though I was personally endangering the people. And that's all I did was post scripture and say, do not forsake the assembling of the saints. That's all I wrote. But look at the difference here between what a Christian is supposed to do and what the world will do in response. You notice Paul, what did he do? He used the scripture to reason with the people. How much opinion is in that? Yeah, that much. He didn't use his opinion. He didn't get all riled up and tell them what I think. No, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. That's what Paul, that's what we should do. But notice the people, jealous of Paul, emotionally driven, okay? Emotionally driven in response. Frantic, irrational behavior. This is what I think. I don't like that. Don't do that. You hear it all the time now. It's rampant now, okay? And what does Paul do? As an example for us, does he go crazy in response? No. He used the scripture to reason with the people, okay? So the reason why we study the Bible, especially the book of Acts, is two reasons. One, we want to know historic truth. Like, I want to know what happened, right? That's good. That's what happened. You see the story there. They went to the town. They shared the gospel. They shared the truth of God's word in the gathering of the people, some people got saved, some people didn't. Some that got jealous and they got mad and they had a riot and all that. You saw that. Historical truth, that's what happened. But the other reason why we study the book of Acts, remember, truth shared and examples shown, right? Because we want to know what happened, but we also, more importantly, want to know what should happen here, right now for you and me and us as a church, okay? We are the people, like Paul, of the truth. We are people of the truth. We are heralds of Scripture, not opinion. 
Okay? Can you get fired up about Jesus? If you're not fired up about Jesus, maybe Jesus isn't inside of you. Okay? So should we get fired up about Jesus? Should we be emotional about Jesus? Absolutely. We should be passionate about what we believe. And if someone tells you to be quiet, you tell them to be quiet. But listen, never driven in what we do purely on emotion. And that's why we here at our church, the sudden and momentous shift in the status quo, we encourage you to read the scriptures, to study the scriptures continually, to meditate on it day and night, right? That's why here at our church, you don't see scripture verses on the screens. You see references so that you can pick up your Bible because you need to be familiar with the word of God so you, like Paul, can use the scriptures to reason with people. They don't need to hear your opinion. Your opinion and your plea never saves anybody. God's word does. It's the power, the, right, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God at work in everyone who believes. Your opinion is not what saves people. God's word leads them to salvation, okay? So when I posted the command of God to get, in Hebrews 10, 25, let me read this to you, this is awesome. So I posted this thing, right? I didn't put up a bunch of my opinion, I just posted what the Bible says, I would think that a pastor could do that, right? And I would think, you guys check, check me if I'm wrong. I would think that the pastor of a Christian church is supposed to do what this says? Yeah, amen. Vote. Let's vote. Yes or no? Yes? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So here's what it says, right? Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us be concerned about one another. Is that important? So, so let's just break this down for a second. We're talking about biblical literacy. We're talking about emotion, feeling-based action rather than truth, right? We're supposed to be truth people. So it says here, let us be concerned about one another. Is that true? Should we be concerned? Yes. Right? Should we care if someone gets corona? Yeah. Absolutely. Should we care if you get into a car accident? Yeah. Should we care if you're broke, can't pay your bills? Yeah. Anything happens, we should care, right? We should be concerned for one another. But how does the Bible tell us to express the concern? Is it, well, don't have church because if you get together, they're going to get sick. You should care about your people. Okay. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our meetings. Right? Listen, let's read it in full. And let us be concerned with one another in order to promote love and good works. That's all good. No one would argue with that. Not staying away from our meeting. Some translations will say, do not neglect the gathering. Other translations would say, do not forsake the assembly. This is the assembly. Should we do Facebook Live? Yes. Should we have a, a, a website? Should we be on YouTube channel? Yes. But those are in addition to, not to substitute. It says you can do these things, but never to forsake the assembly. You want to love people? You want to stir them up to love and good works? Then don't forsake the assembly. And we have, not here, praise God, we have nationwide forsaken the assembly. So what have we done? We have forsaken our concern for one another. And it doesn't matter what you think about it or what I think, because my opinion and yours means nothing. This is the truth. And he said, you want to show love and concern for one another? Then don't forget to meet together. Let's read on. You can clap for God. Do not forsake our, our meetings as some habitually do. God is so calling them out right now, every person who's not here. As some people make a habit of doing. Some people just blow off church most of the time. But, but God says, right, don't. <laughs> you made it, bro. 
Nice. He said, don't blow it up. Listen, we got a problem in this country. Churches need to close. Okay. What? 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 But, uh, uh, eh. Listen. Do not forsake the assembly of the, of the saints as some habitually do. But instead of that, instead of blowing it off, right? But encouraging each other. And watch this. And all the more as the day draws near. All the more. As the, do you know about the day? The day, right? We're all going to have a day. Either your day is going to be when you take your last breath, or he's going to cut the clouds and come down. But one of those things is going to happen. We're all having a day, right? We're all having a day. And every time you flip the calendar one more page, you know you get closer to that day. Whenever it is, I don't know. But as the day goes on, instead of being like everyone else who habitually blows off church, we're supposed to gather even more, it says. Even more. Someone say amen, right? That's what We're supposed to meet here all the time, right? We're supposed to gather together all the time. Not just once a week, not once a month, not on Facebook Live. It says it in God's word. Do not forsake the assembly and do it even more as the day approaches. And instead, we're doing it less and less all the time. Do you ever wonder why the church of Jesus Christ is just dwindling in America? And it's ramping up like crazy in, like, Iraq, right? In China, where it's illegal. We're told, you can, you can worship here. It's like in our, what is the First Amendment says, you can freely gather. You can, do, like, and, and all these rights are given to you from your sovereign divine one. And, and, and we don't even go. And the Bible's, the Bible's saying, listen, as the day approaches, don't, forsa- don't blow off the gathering, but have more gatherings. As soon as someone says, don't gather, we go, okay, sure. Sure, Dr. Fauci. We'll just stop doing what Jesus said. I mean, I understand that he says that all authority in heaven and earth is his, but we'll just, we'll just obey you instead. So I post this about gathering together because that's what we're supposed to do and I am just shredded, right? Some of you saw it. It It's fun. I got to share with you the best one. I may have shared this with some of you guys. Some of you are here some weeks, some of you are not. I've told you in private too. Best, Best one ever. Best one ever. Supposed to gather, supposed to gather, supposed to gather. We're talking about irrational, emotional responses versus truth, right? So I post on there that we're going to be gathering I think it's actually the time that we that we were going to have our Monday night prayer group. I mean, Jesus did say this is supposed to be a house of prayer, right? So it should be a, a house of prayer, right? <laughs> right? So we're going to do a Monday night prayer group. Now, Grant, you guys understand this, like, and I'm not saying this to boast or anything that's good because I think that we we don't do a really good job of, of our prayer time together. But we usually have, you know, when when before this whole thing happened, we we would have on good weeks we'd have. And it was 65 to 85 people on a Sunday morning. So we're an average tri- size church in America. That's the average size church is 75 people or under. And on a Monday night for prayer, which I think is supposed to be really important to Jesus, or he wouldn't have called this thing a house of prayer, we we'll, might have six or seven people here. Say this. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Right? But I posted that we're going to gather for prayer and I put it on one of the like word of mouth or something saying hey we're going to gather for prayer and in this crazy time obviously prayer is important and it would be our pleasure and privilege to pray for you what are your prayer requests and I send it out there to the whole city of Leesburg I got a couple of people wrote in and said you know my son my job my you know whatever good stuff and we prayed but this one person says this. Well, that's the church down there by the Home Depot. And having gone to their website and noticed, this is going to be a good place for an amen. 
that they have some kind of a meeting almost every day at that church. I'm not shopping at Home Depot anymore. It's Lowe's for me. You can go on and see it's still there. And I'm just sitting here like, I'm doing what y'all are doing. I'm laughing, right? I'm like, really? So the six people that are in here, in this building, that's not part of that building, somehow the COVID cootie cloud floated over there and poisoned the whole store. But, but listen, the thousand people a day that are in that store with touching all the stuff and touching the credit card machines and holding the shopping carriages and opening and closing doors, that is nothing to be feared for. But our little six people with our little church lady sitting there with her walker praying to God for you, that's a problem. I can't go to Home Depot anymore. I'm going to Lowe's because the thousand people at Lowe's that are infecting that place, that's no big deal, but don't go to church. Totally irrational thinking, right? It's insane. Listen, I had Christians, I'm not going to cuss, but I'm going to let you know. I had Christians online tell me when I said we're going to gather for prayer, effing pray at home like I do with my family. That's what the Christian wrote on Facebook, but he didn't use an F. He used the whole word. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> this is what's going on, right? It's totally crazy. The world's lost its mind. Totally lost its mind. And we see this same thing. Like, it's nothing new. Solomon says, nothing new under the sun, right? Yeah. Same thing in Acts chapter 17. 2,000 years ago. Completely irrational thing. Here's just a little group of guys. I don't even know how many people are with Paul and Silas. There, there, there could have been two or three, maybe five or six. I don't know. Just a little group of, of traveling evangelists going around from city to city, just telling whoever would listen, right? And, and they start like, like our little prayer group, right? And they start, they grab, there's a mob that forms. There's a riot that forms. They rip them out of the house. I mean, it's just crazy. They falsely accuse these people. They have no idea what they're talking about. And then they make them pay a fee. That sounds familiar. <laughs> so here's the point. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, that he tells us about our motivation here. It's Christ's love that compels us, right? His love for you should compel you to go and be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, to go make disciples of all people, right? Even the crazy ones. So we all understand what our job is, but what we need to get in our minds, don't be deceived here. It's not cushy and comfy. It's hard. It's hard. The Christian life is not this guy. Put him up, that, right? That's what's preached often. Hey, isn't everything just great? I got Jesus. I got a sweet house. He's blessed me financially, and everyone's healthy and happy, and I go to church a couple times a year. <coughs> But I give a lot, so, you know, I bought my indulgences. I'm good. It's not this. Let me read something, okay? It's not this. It's actually this. It's more like Christianity. Ephesians chapter 6 says that we are saved into a battle against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. It's war. That's what you're called into. That's what you've been saved into. You understand? And if you're not experiencing some of that, I wonder what hybrid, fake, self-contrived thing that you call Christianity is in your head. Because that's what we're called into. Okay? That's what we're called into. I was reading this, and I was just thinking, man, wouldn't it be awesome if the people at Revolution Church 
could be found guilty of what they found Paul and Silas to be guilty of? Causing trouble all over the world. That would be awesome, right? I want us to cause trouble all over the world. <laughs> Here's what Paul would say to Timothy, his young little disciple, his future pastor, his man of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. And I believe he would say it to you and I this morning if he was here. He would say, join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. Fighting for the souls of men and women across the earth. Delivering them from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of light. From death to life. Listen, loved ones. We don't need to be all emotionally driven. So much so that we get ugly. Because we're all guilty of that sometimes. But we need to be vocal. We need to share the word of God with people. We need to stand up for something that God stands up for. Okay? We need to fight the good fight of faith. We need to po Listen, you need to make some videos and post videos on, on, face on, on, on Facebook and stuff, like telling people the truth of God's word, pictures and videos and, and stories and testimonies, and, and put God's word up on there, right? And we need to, we need to be a voice of justice in every possible way that we can. And we need to define truth. Like, we need to define good and bad, right and wrong, based on the word of God, and make it public. Don't be quiet. Don't lay down and don't ever stop, right? That's what we're supposed to do. That's what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to do. You know the apostle said in Acts chapter 4, how could we, we cannot stop telling you what we've seen and heard. I can't stop. I will not stop. They told him, stop or we'll put you in jail. I don't care. Stop or we'll beat you. I don't care. And they kept doing it. They kept doing it. kept doing it. That. That's war. And that's what these people were in. And that's what you and I are in right now. And any other illusion you've created in your mind of what Christianity is is false. That's what it is. It's hard. And we're supposed to suffer and sacrifice and push the kingdom of God forward. That's our job. We're not supposed to sacrifice the truth on the altar of political correctness. Because people's souls are far more important than their feelings. And people need to know the truth, okay? They need to know the truth. How many people are on Facebook in this place right now? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're on Facebook. If you have a Facebook account, raise your hand. Raise your hand, okay? Do you have your phone with you right now? Do you have your phone with you? Pull it out. It's your chance to use your phone in, in church. Pull it out, put your camera on. Pull it out, put your camera on. Got your camera on? It's going to take a few minutes, but take your, take your phone out, pull your camera out. Camera, are you on? Are you on? Everybody on? Don't look at, don't take videos of me, okay? Put it on camera. Take a picture. Put that up on the screen, Michael. See that up on the screen? I want you all to take a, listen, stand with me right now, right? Take a picture of that, and I want you to post it. I want you to check in at Revolution Church, and I want you to post that on your wall right now. Stand up for the truth. Everything was created by Christ and for Christ. That's the truth, ain't it? You need to let the people know. Let everyone know. Never stop, never be quiet, never lay down, always relentlessly pursuing the truth and letting the truth be known, which is God's word. Let it out right now, everyone in this room. I don't care. You can get on Facebook as long as you're using it for this. Use it for Jesus. It's good. We'll give a little bit more time for your Android people. Takes a few more buttons to press to get through, I know. You can, you can't you? No, no, no. Let me see. See? It's an Android. We give you grace. <laughs> huh? Yeah, man. All right, church, listen. Did you do it? You got to engage. You got to get off the bench. You got to get in the game. You got to be vocal, not obnoxious. Listen, emotionally driven vocal is obnoxious and ugly. Truth driven, reasoning with the scriptures, that's effective. 
Okay, that's effective, and that's what people need to hear. And listen, if they don't like it, what you post, who's their, is their problem with you? No, their problem is with God. Their problem is with themselves. But post the truth, because we believe that everything was created by Christ and for Christ. That means you live for Christ. You're a mother for Christ. You're a father for Christ. You're a pastor for Christ. You're a cook for Christ. You're a policeman for Christ. You're a DJ for Christ. You're a friend for Christ. You're an employer for Christ. You're an employee for Christ. You're a politician for Christ. Everything is for Christ. Everything, everything, everything. And our life should show that everything that we are and everything that we have is for his purposes. Our time, our resources, our focus, everything is for him. Someone say amen. Awesome. All right. It's time we got to draw a sword, man. You know the Bible's the sword of the spirit, right? You got to pull that thing out of the sheath and you got to use it, man. You got to use it. God's so good, right? 2,000 years later, and somehow, some way, he's preserved this thing so we could actually know who he is and who we are and our need for him and how to get there. Awesome, right? The, the, by far, it's crazy how awesome this book is. When I started reading this book, when I first got I was like, I couldn't put it down. It was like the biggest plate of lasagna I ever had in my I just keep eating feet in my face, like endlessly. It was incredible, right? Incredible. And, you, and we don't understand the importance of it and the value that we have at our disposal, the, 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 the truth that's there that we can live our life on. Like, and so many people are hurting and lost and clueless and, and scared and depressed, and all the while God has the answers for them right there in that book, and we don't even pick it up. It's a shame. Let's move on. Let's move on. So the next section in Acts 17, it's not necessarily that violent this thing right here you know where good and evil are clashing with swords and axes and machine guns and fire and torches and all that stuff but it's definitely a battleground it's just a little less violent this battleground is the battle for truth inside the church okay so I want to read Acts 17, 10 through 15. So that very night, after Jason and them got arrested and had to pay a fine and released, that very night, and you think, man, they got to stop, they got to stop. At some point, enough is enough. You've done what you're supposed to do. Now it's Jules' turn. Now he can do it. I'm done. I've done my part. No. That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. So it's just... If you looked on a map, it's just hop, skip, and a jump. Next town. Think um, Leesburg, Tiberias, or Eustace kind of a thing. Just right down the road. The very night the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. I mean, these guys are gluttons for punishment, right? They just keep going back, right? Because their comfort didn't outweigh the mission. The mission outweighs the comfort. Do you understand? And they understood that. Paul says, woe to me if I do not preach. Like, we all agree that God, that, that, that Paul is going to be, when you get to heaven, whenever that is, is Paul going to be there? Yes. He's definitely going to be there, right? He's the guy. And even that guy who's like absolutely like the mayor of heaven, right? That, not really. That's just a fun thing. <laughs> I, I'm just, I don't want you to think that that's biblical. It's not, right? But even that guy who knows he's going to be there, we all know he's going to be there. He's like, woe to me if I don't preach. Like there's still some room. Even though I'm going to be in heaven, there's still some room between now and then where God could give me a spanking, and I don't want that. So I'm preaching, man. So he goes off to the next town again. And he goes right back into the Jewish synagogue, just think church like this here, into the gathering of people. He says, but the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. As a result, many Jews believed and Many prominent Greek women and men. 
But when some Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God, I love that too, like he wasn't preaching his opinion. So God's word goes out of its way to make sure you understand that Paul is not preaching opinion. He's not emotionally driven. He's preaching the word of God. He's reasoning with the people with the scriptures. And you, listen, you can't reason with the scriptures if you're not a student of the scriptures, right? You can't share scripture with people that, if you don't know the scriptures, Casper's a football coach. How's he going to teach his players the plays if he doesn't know the plays, right? Is that going to make any sense? How many games are they going to win if that was the case? But that's the case in our football game all the time because we're biblically illiterate. And I'm not saying that insulting. I, hopefully you're hearing this and it's compelling you to want to pick up your Bible more so you can be more effective. Not condemning you. Please don't. Take it that way. But he was preaching the word of God in Berea. And so the people in Thessalonica, they're like, well, we got, we got after him before, but let's get after him again. And so the believers acted at once because these guys were going to stir up trouble again. And they sent Paul onto the coast while Silas and Timothy remained behind. Those escorting Paul went with him all the way to Athens. Then they returned to Berea with instructions for Silas and Timothy to hurry and join him there. Okay. Awesome. So, there's a battle for the truth in the church. And so let's just see what, what this teaches us here. We see that Paul preached the word of God. We see that Silas preached the word of God. And then this is the most important thing for you. Because you're not up here preaching. You're the people, right? You're the people. But what did the people do? And that should be your job. Before they searched, what did they do? They listened eagerly, right? The King James would say they had a readiness of mind, okay? Readiness of mind. The word in Greek is prothumia. It means a predisposed mind. That means a mind that already came in cheerful and susceptible to hearing and accepting, like now we have this corona thing, and some people are, have, have pre-existing conditions that make them susceptible to the infection, right? There's some weakness, there's some openness in their pores in their life that makes them susceptible to that invasion. And what, what this is saying here in the book of Acts is that we need to come in with a mind that is susceptible, that is weak enough, not so strong will that it won't listen, but it comes predisposed, predetermined, premeditated. I'm coming in because I know God's word is right and true and good, and I'm not looking to, to hear everything that I already believe, but I want to be challenged, and I'm ready to hear it and bend my life and my will under the word of God. That's how you come to church. You come saying, I'm going to church. I am going to church. And I am going in realizing that his word is true and right. And I'm not always true and right. And I need to hear it. And my mind is open and susceptible to hearing this. I'm eager to listen and to submit my will to the word of God. Is that you? Is that you right now? Are you unhappy that I'm yelling? Are you unhappy that we don't have a band? Are you unhappy with the seating arrangements? Are you unhappy with the color? Are you unhappy with the topic? Are you, or are you saying, you know what, all that doesn't matter? God's right, I'm wrong, I'm listening, I'm coming into church ready to hear the word of God and submit my will to it. I have come here today to learn how I can be more obedient to you, Lord, so that you can use me more effectively to advance your kingdom. So they listened eagerly. They had a predisposed mind. I am coming in ready to hear you, Lord, and ready to submit to you. That's what they did. And then the second thing is, they searched the scriptures. When? Every day. 
day after day. And why? Listen, we all said that Paul was like the guy, right? I jokingly said he's the mayor of heaven. He's not, but he's going to be there, right? He, 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 the apostle, Paul, like if, if the apostle Paul was preaching here every weekend, would you be here? Absolutely. Let's just, let's just be honest, right? I don't have the same draw that the apostle Paul has. And that's sad because I'm just preaching his words. So really shouldn't be any different. But he's the, pre- he's the preacher. Paul himself is the preacher. And yet the word of God sees fit to challenge, tell people to challenge Paul and make sure that what even he is saying is correct. Just think about that. The apostle Paul. And we're like, well, he couldn't be wrong. But God's word the Holy Spirit inspires this dude, Luke, to, say, to write this. They, they weren't just doing it, but he put it in the Bible, right, so that there's an example shown for us so that we can do the same thing. We need to make sure that the preacher is right. Listen, so much rides on that, and authority never rests on the preacher. It, it doesn't just end with me. I'm just doing the best job that I know how, following the call in my life that Jesus told me to go tell people about him and use that book, and I'm doing it the best I can. But the final authority is not mine. It's Jesus Christ, and it's expressed in his word. So that's why we're supposed to study it. And if I had a dollar for every time someone shared with me what they believe because of what they were taught by some preacher or whatever, and has absolutely no basis in the Bible. I would be rich man. I hear it all the time. Remember Pastor Jake, God love him. He was talking about that time when, when it, this is the famous one. God will never give you more than you can stand. Right. That sounds Christian-y, doesn't it? Yeah. Except there's a Bible story and Paul says, God pushed us beyond what we could tolerate, so we learned to lean on him. Yeah, God gives you way more than you can tolerate so that you'll run into his arms and ask him for help. That's why he says, share the yoke with me. He's like, I want you to yoke up with me. I'm going to give you more than you can tolerate, so you need me. And if you hook up, I'll take you through it. He didn't say, I'm not going to burden you down and weigh you down so you don't need me. He'll give you an easy life so you never have to ask me for nothing. That's not the way it works. Listen, I got a secret for you. What a secret? The secret is, is that I have a seminary degree in biblical studies. And I've done this like almost 600 times. And I have a microphone. But I'm not always right. I'm really not always right. Not intentionally. But I'm a man, and my brain is the size of a softball, and God, the Bible says that the entire universe are but the fringes of his robe. The entire universe is a string hanging off the robe of Almighty God. Do you have a string on your shirt? I don't have one to illustrate, but let's just say this. The entire universe is this compared to God. And I'm one person with a pea brain. So all authority doesn't rest on me at all. See, God called us all to be ambassadors of Christ. He told us that he is making his plea through us. So we all have a responsibility to pursue the truth beyond what I say. Do you understand? It's your job. It's your responsibility. And you have to base your salvation on that. You base your relationship eternally with God based on that. And you base your discipling, whoever you're discipling, and you should be, You're basing your discipling on what you know of God through his word, not through what I tell you. It's that important. 
So when you come to church, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it now. From now on, and I know nobody cares about what their pastor says in America anymore, but I'm just going to pretend that we're in the days of old. From now on, when you come to church, have a Bible, have a notebook, and have a pen. Listen, I'm not kidding. Have a Bible, have a notebook, have a pen. Why? How are you going to test the scriptures day in and day out and test what I say if you don't remember what it was? Don't look, don't look on, don't, I want you to he, look at me right now. Don't look at your notebook. What Bible verses have I quoted on that screen this morning? That's good. Awesome. One, this is good. He's good. That's pretty good right there. One dude in here saying it. That's pretty good. Props. Right? I know, I saw that. I see, what's that? <laughs> he wants to eat the word. That's a good man. Future preacher right there. I love it. But, but do you understand what I'm saying? Like, that Bible, notebook, and pen, right? Bible, notebook, and pen. Invest in this. It's important enough. Know the scriptures. Be a student of the scriptures. Test what I say. I don't ever want to lead you astray. I never ever want to lead you down a road to destruction. But listen, I might, right? I might say something wrong. I might not interpret it right. I might not understand it right. Maybe I was in a bad mood when I wrote my sermon. Listen, I'm human. I've done this 600 times almost. I've made mistakes. I'll make them again. And your, your, your eternity is in the balance of all this. And I understand the weight that's on me. And that's why he says, not everyone should be a teacher. Judge double, judge double. I get it. But ultimately... Your salvation has nothing to do with my judgment. Your salvation has everything to do with what you think about what you did with Jesus based on your Bible. And so you need to be a student of the Bible, okay? So let's kind of finish up here, okay? When you come to church, you need to come with a relaxed will toward God. A relaxed will. Right? That doesn't mean lazy, complacent. That means your will is going, look, watch this, this. See, when we bow, when we pray, like, it doesn't really do anything, but it definitely sends a message to God. Your will, not mine. Like, you're big, I'm little. You're right, I'm wrong. I'm going to do what you say. I don't like what, I don't like that verse he just told me. I don't like it, Lord. I'm going to go home and I'm going to research it. But my predisposed mind, Lord, says, I'm willing to listen and I'm willing to lay down my will. If that's really what you want, if that's really what you command, then I will do it. Notice the difference between the Thessalonians and the Bereans. <clears throat> the Thessalonians, emotion-driven, lack of understanding. They're accusing them of treason when it was really not treason. They're causing trouble all over the world. False claims, irrational behavior, mobs and riots. Chaos. But in Berea... They didn't respond that way. They studied the scriptures day and night. And what was the results there? Many Jews and Greeks became believers. So if we're called into the battle as a soldier of Christ Jesus, right? Hold up your sword. Hold up your sword, right? Here's your sword. And it's time to become a student of the, of, the, of the sword and pull that thing out of its sheath. Pull it out, study it, and use it, right? 
It's the, listen, loved ones, I love you, and I don't know what you're doing today, but I can say this with complete confidence. There's nothing more important in this world than this. Nothing. Nothing. And nothing will affect the next million years of your existence more than this. And so every other thing should be swept aside and this is the priority of your life because your eternity and the eternity of everyone you come across that you begin to speak this to is in the balance, not their job, not their bank account, not their earthly relationships. Although, listen, all those things are spoken of in here too. But their eternity in what we all agreed, there's a heaven and there's a hell. And everyone's eternity rests in the balance of what they say about this. Do you understand the weight of the importance of this now? And maybe you're in this room right now and you're 50, 60, 70 years old and you've read the Bible a little bit, but my hope and prayer this morning is that you have a fresh understanding of the weight of what and value of what this is and what it could mean to you and what it could mean to your children and what it could mean to the people around you. It can change the trajectory of an entire family tree. I'm the first in my family to be a Christian. So you understand the importance of this to me and my wife and my kids and maybe even my mother and sister and all that that are Jews. It's important, man. It's important. Come on, let's pray together. And let's, let's just exercise what I said a moment ago, just like a bow, just a bow, just a bow before God. Father, I, I just ask you right now that you would receive this posture in all of us now as a statement of our will that says we are bowing our will to you. That, Lord, that, that your word is truth, it is good, it is right, and, and, and it is always good. And, and no matter what the pasture is, Lord, that you bring us to, if you bring us there, Lord, then it's green. And it is delicious and it is good because it accomplishes your purposes, not my comfort. And so, Lord, continue to call us into uncomfortable pastures, but help us to, to respond differently than we have in the past, where when it's difficult and we feel like we have to push and it's hard that somehow we been taught that that must not be you Holy Spirit you you need to help us find peace in it and we have to feel like you want us to be there and and and, and I don't feel prompted listen when you call us into something uncomfortable it's to accomplish your purposes and so help us to to accept being uncomfortable help us to persevere through persecution help us to celebrate through circumstance Help us to push forward. And when we push, get pushed back, help us to push forward afresh. And God, I, and you've just placed it in my heart so many years ago to be a man who studied your scripture and to tell people about you using your book. And Lord, I, that's, the, that's what all of us are supposed to do. Tell people about you by using your book. Thank you for your book, Lord. Thank you for your book. It is true, it is right, it is good, it is, a, it is just, it's refreshing for our soul, it brings joy to our heart, it makes wise the simple. It's precious and valuable. Help us to view it and hold on to it as such. And now, Lord, as we turn our attention to further kingdom advancement, I'm asking you, Father, to, to speak to your children and let them know what giving looks like for them. What does it look like to partner? Like you said, that you've been called into partnership with Jesus. What does that look like for us individually? So our Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would continue to speak to your people just like you always do. And speak to us now and help us to know what you want for us. What does generosity look like for us individually? What does thanksgiving look for us 
individually? What does partnering with you look like individually? And give us the will and the desire to do what pleases you and say yes to whatever you prompt us to do. As uncomfortable as it may be, as sacrificial as it may be, no matter how much suffering it may be, help us to obey you now. In Jesus' name, we're listening.